This week, the Pool Nation podcast is proud to welcome Bob Lowry, an icon in the swimming pool industry. Chances are, if you've studied water chemistry, you've studied Bob's work. Welcome, Bob Lowry, to the Pool Nation podcast. Welcome, everyone, to the Pool Nation live podcast with myself, your host, Edgar De Jesus. And yes, I am the reigning champion of Marco Polo, along with John J.J. Flawless, the fastest knitter in the West, and the famous Zach, the pool boy, Nicholas. And this week, we'll be talking to our friend and legend, Bob Larry. For those of you that know Bob, you know he's a legend in our industry. For those of you that are new, you know that Bob has written 21 books on pool water chemistry, and even the manuals that IPSA uses for training were written by Bob. Bob is a regular on our podcast. He comes once a month to do the Pool Geek Talk with us. So tune in, grab some popcorn, and enjoy this live podcast. I want to welcome everyone to the live podcast, the podcast where it's all pool talk, and we ain't talking about netting and jetting or splashing and dashing. We're talking about becoming a nation of pool pros. And yes, we will talk about the latest products, trends, and training in the pool industry. Before we get started today, I want to thank our sponsors for the podcast, The Ultimate Pool Tools and Pool Invoice. We want to thank them for their continued support. Zach, good morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. I hope you all are doing well. I just got to say I got my learning hat on today, and I'm ready to rock. Great. John, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I've got to say the same with Zach. Every time we do these podcasts with Bob, I like to just sit back, listen, and learn. How was that golf game yesterday, my friend? We're, we're not talking about that? No. We talk. <laughs> if you call it golf, <laughs> look, it's an accomplishment because I literally, I think I only lost like two sleeves of balls <laughs> golfing. So I'm usually down like 50, 60 bucks in balls every time I golf. So we kind of figured out a thing. We thought, well, okay, well, we should hit the range first before we start golfing so I can use some of the range balls and save myself some money. But I actually did pretty good or I did better than last time. So I'm content. <laughs> So instead of four sleeves, you're down to two? Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's, we that's like four bucks a ball, right? So <laughs> that's great. Hey, Bob, good morning. How you doing? Hey, good morning from Lima, Peru. It's good to, good to be here again. Yeah, we love having you on, Bob. Guys, before we get started today, I want to mention that this week we will not have an Instagram Live because it's so close to Christmas and everyone's on vacation mode. So after this 2020, I think everybody deserves that. I think everybody deserves to take a nice, good vacation and just kind of cut out of everything as we get ready to go into 2021. But for the next week, and that's going to be Wednesday, December the 30th, we're going to start our plunge into the new year with four weeks of giveaways. And we're going to be doing some great giveaways. We have uh, Jandy that came through, right, John, with, uh, what was it, an MX-6 or Polaris? Yeah, uh, either a suction side or a pressure side cleaner, depending on the market. So if you guys are going to need a pressure side, I think it's a Polaris 280. And then for the suction side, pull guys, it'll be a MX-6 Elite. That is awesome. The other thing is Terry with Hasa donated a liquidator from them. So they'll be able to ship that out to you as well. We have a Taylor test kit and also a 3 by 20 hyper pull from the Ultimate Pull Tool. That's the really kind of long one. So thanks to Ken for that. Guys, we need to come up with kind of some rules or what we want to do for that. What, what do you guys think we should do? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I think everybody should do is download Podbean, right? And subscribe and listen to the podcast. But as far as other rules, I think we're going to have to sit down and kind of make it a little interesting because, you know, the list of gifts that we just announced is just a beginning. I think we're going to have a lot more and hopefully it's going to become a tradition for our Pool Nation family so that we're able to give some gifts or give something back, at least during the holiday season for everybody. Let's become the Ellen of giveaways. <laughs> you get a, or Oprah. You, you get, get a, a cleaner. You get, you yeah. get a liquid. <laughs> everybody gets a Polaris. And then hey, we, get real, we get real, free, uh, real freaky and go, check under your seat, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have no clue. Yeah. Like, well, I, I don't know what I to did do. That. I did that one time I was given a, a one of my classes and we had like 30 people in the class and one of our sponsors was uh, Lamont that makes the spin touch yeah. and they had a, they had a rep in the back of the room and I said you know the cool thing about about it is one of our sponsors is Lamont and they're going to give a spin touch to every one of you guys today oh for free <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the guy practically fainted. Oh, I'm sure, right. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Way to put him on the spot, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I said, just kidding, everybody, but we are going to have a drawing for one. <laughs> Uh, I bet right. you he probably said, uh, yeah, I'm never doing that class with Bobby. Yeah, he that. just <laughs> – I mean, this guy was sweating bullets when I said that. You know? uh, I, would, I would be too. Can you imagine? <laughs> that would be the class to be in though, right, John? Uh, absolutely, right? <laughs> Zach? Yeah, no more webinars. I'm going in person. <laughs> <laughs> so, Zach, what do you think some of the things that we should do for the for the giveaway? You know, that's – I mean – I've never run any sort of giveaway, um, but I'm thinking there's going to be like some likes and some sharing, some commenting, some things along those lines. And uh-huh. I don't know. I mean, if anyone else has any ideas, definitely let me know, uh, you know, message me because that's all new to me. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to kind of put those out. But yeah, I, John was um, talking to a couple other people that wanted to kind of give some products for the giveaway. So we'll talk about those and met, maybe we'll stretch it out into six or seven weeks of giveaway so that the New Year's is really a good New Year's. So, all right, guys. So you know, maybe you could maybe you could do some kind of a um, quiz or a contest or something where you pose, you know, five questions and the first person to answer all five of them right gets the gift. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, and, that's and you make you make the questions based on the content of the podcast. No, I think that's a great idea. Oh, that's an awesome idea. Yeah. Bob, really <laughs> Devin, <laughs> Bob with the win, man. How, Bob how much with does the win. John? How much does John spend on golf balls when he when he, when he golf? <laughs> what kind of Crocs does John yeah, wear? Right. Yeah, what color are John's Crocs? Exactly. <laughs> oh man, you, you guys will have to do some research on Instagram and then make some calling, but no calling me or, or Zach for the answer on that one. Yeah. Right. Well, but if you know, if you make the if you make the questions based on the content of the podcast, then they have to listen to the podcast to figure out the answers. That's a, such a great yeah. idea. We're, we're definitely going to do that one. So. <laughs> God, we, we should have, I should have included Bob yesterday while we were trying to figure it out, guys. And we would have been like, okay, done. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Bob, thanks for taking the time to come and, and talk with us. And we're excited to have you on the podcast. Before we jump in, I want to ask you, how was playing St. Nick for the kids out there in Peru yesterday? Uh, it was, it was totally awesome. I, for the last, I think, eight years, I have been Santa Claus, which here is called Papa Noel. And um, I successively has gotten better, and I spent a lot of money on a Santa suit. And I think even my family can't tell I'm Santa when I wear it. It's pretty cool. Or I can't tell I'm Bob when I'm wearing it. So at any rate, we drove around in a car yesterday and stopped at 25 kids' homes, and Papa Noel gave each of them two gifts that were in the school and all the kids were from two to five years old and they were just delighted and amazed and, you know, wide eyed and hugging Santa. And, you know, it was just a great thing and lots of photos and stuff being taken. And it, it just does my heart good to do stuff like that. It was really cool. That's awesome. So, nor- but normally you do where they come over to the house. Is that what they do in this year? Yeah, we obviously. usually have a party at our house for the kids. And the kids come in and they party and play games and do stuff. And then Papa Noel shows up and he sits in a big chair. And each kid comes up and gets a gift from Papa Noel. And then they go away and the school year is over because the school year is here from, from March until December. So uh, at Christmas time, the school year is over for them. And uh, so they get their gifts and they get the stuff and school's over. And so it's pretty cool. But um, this year, because of the pandemic, we visited each kid's school because we can't have can't have a party here to have Papa Noel. So Papa Noel visited each of their homes and it was awesome. And that's such a great thing, Bob. John, yeah. Zach, I'm thinking next year for Christmas, we take a trip down to Peru Bob will just have to tell us what day he's doing Santa Claus so we can get our gifts yeah, down there too. That's it. I'll drive right by your house and drive right by your house and, and, and give you one of those free spin touches. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So pencil in that vacation for next year. We're going down to Peru. <clears throat> yeah. You, and you get to see Machu Picchu while you're here. Yes, Definitely. 
So, all right, guys, let's get started with all these pool questions that we have for you, Bob. And anybody want to jump in with one of the questions, Zach, John? Yeah. So, okay, here's one of the questions um, that were submitted. It says, I saw a video on Poolman University about galvanic corrosion. Uh, can you guys talk about it? I thought it was interesting. Can't find much on it. Yeah, that's the problem. There isn't much on it. but And it's not too difficult to understand. Galvanic corrosion happens when you have two dissimilar pieces of metal and some form of electricity. And the more noble the metal, meaning, you know, like gold and platinum are at the top and, you know, lead is at the bottom, the more noble the metal, the less it's likely to get a deposit. So um, what happens is the lower metals get kind of dissolved. They literally start to eat away the, uh, the lesser metals. A swimming pool, when you think about it, is like a very large uh, low-voltage battery, especially if it's a salt pool. It's got lots of salt in it and ionization, and that makes it even more of a battery. And then if you have some stray electricity, meaning that everything is not completely grounded, now you have even more voltage and you have a buildup usually of metal around one of the metal things in the pool. Usually where you see galvanic corrosion is you'll see a black deposit around a light ring or uh, around the escutcheon uh, by the ladder or anything that's metal in the pool, you'll start to see a black or a dark gray develop around that. And that means that there's galvanic corrosion. And so the way to get rid of that, of course, is to make sure that every piece of electrical equipment in the pool is properly grounded. And that would be one common copper wire to a grounding point. And um, usually it's even better for the grounding point that you have a a stake that's made of steel that's pounded into the ground and it has to reach into the ground six feet and that will ground all of the equipment. But that's where it come from and that's how it happens. So I, I got a follow-up question on that. Is is it reversible? So for instance, if you properly bond the pool and the equipment, um, does it is it reversible or can you only just stop it from happening? No, it, it, you can only stop it. But one of the things that you can do if you can't buy, if you can't make sure that all the equipment is bonded and grounded, one of the things you can do is you can buy what's called a sacrificial and it's made out of lead and you put it in the pool and it is the first thing to go. So question following up on that, that sacrificial anode, I'm guessing would have to be replaced periodically? Yeah, eventually it'll have to be replaced. They, they usually last a year or 18 months. And, and so that's like when we see the light rings and they're turning black, that's because of that galvanic corrosion. That's correct. Or that's correct. Start seeing and all you need to do is bond the equipment and it will stop. It'll save a heat exchanger too. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Probably, yes. So I have a question, Bob. How do I treat or what is the best way to treat a pool that has had bad black algae breakout? Okay, um, that's one of the questions we get a lot. And, you know, algae is a, is a super big problem. And the question is, how do you get rid of it? I think probably the first thing that you should try is just a, you know, a hyperchlorination, a big dose of chlorine and see if that doesn't help, you know, brush a lot and uh, put in a big dose of chlorine. You already have the chlorine on your truck, pour some extra in and, and see if that'll make it go away. And that's kind of just the first line of defense. See if chlorine will work. And then the next thing to do is I'm still partial to, to using chlorine because it, it really does work. But what you need to do is put a lot of chlorine in there and have a high enough chlorine for a long enough period of time that it will kill it. And people get anxious and they don't want to have high levels of chlorine and so on. And so they never actually reach the point um, that they're killing the algae. And the way to do it is to put a dose of chlorine in the pool that is either 25 parts per million or 40% 
of the cyanuric acid level, depending on whichever number is higher. And so you put in 25 parts per million of chlorine, and then in the beginning, you need to test like all the time to see if the chlorine is going away. And in the beginning, the chlorine is consumed by the algae, and that's what kills it. But it lowers the chlorine level, and you have to replace it. You need to keep the level at 25 parts per million for 24 hours or even 48, depending on how bad the algae is. So in the beginning, you might check an hour after you put chlorine in, and if it's gone down to 20, you have to go back up to 25. And then you check it in an hour, and if it doesn't go down, you check it in two hours. And if it's gone down, then you you add some more chlorine. And you can extend the time period uh, each time that there is no loss of chlorine, you can extend the time. And then um, eventually you get to the point where essentially overnight or eight to 10 hours with no change in the chlorine level, then the algae is dead. But you have to maintain it for that long. So sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's 48. But usually 48 hours at 25 parts per million and you're done. But you can't put the 25 parts per million and come back in two days. That isn't the way it works. You have to maintain 25 parts per million. So on that, is there anything, once we've got that 25 parts per million holding in the water um, and the algae has gone and we're not seeing that chlorine drop, do we need to turn around and put like a chlorine reducer to bring that back down to normal level? Or do you just say, let it, let it run its course and, you know, pulls off limits for, whatever that period of time is until we get back to a normal level of chlorine? Or what's your approach on that? Okay, well, think of, let's think about a couple of things. First of all, it takes 10 parts per million of cyanuric acid to cover uh, one part per million of free chlorine. So if you have 50 parts per million of cyanuric acid in the pool, it's only going to cover five parts per million of chlorine. So if you put in 25, you've got 20 parts per million of chlorine in the pool that essentially uh, is subject to being destroyed by sunlight. And the degradation is about 75% in two hours. So you can lose a lot of chlorine that's unprotected. You can lose it pretty quick to sunlight. But it may not stay around very long, but depending on how sunny it is, you can use a chlorine neutralizer, and the good news is for finding a chlorine neutralizer, I'm not sure that all of the, the uh, distributors sell it, but all of the Leslie stores sell a chlorine neutralizer. And so you can go in there and buy some chlorine neutralizer and put it in the pool. It's, it's not very difficult to do. I have Perfect. a question. I have a question on that chlorine neutralizer. I want to come back to the black algae, but I used to use that chlorine neutralizer, Bob, and I would see, especially when I added it to spa, that my alkalinity would be affected. Would that be the case, or is that just something that, for some odd reason, happened to yeah, me? Yeah, most, of, making it most of the chlorine reducers are um, acidic. And so because they're acidic, they're going to lower the alkalinity a little bit. If you can't find chlorine neutralizer... You can buy hydrogen peroxide and put it in the pool, and it dechlorinates. And so, so in a in a fifteen thousand gallon pool, it takes about uh, a quart of three percent hydrogen peroxide to destroy one part per million of chlorine. I have a question f to follow up in algae in general. From my understanding, you know, we've talked in the past about crutches or magic pills and things like that. And, you know, there's all these different types of algicides out there, and I get it, they can help, but we should be able to fix the problem with just chlorine itself. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say is without without spending a lot of money, you know, algicides are expensive, and, and chlorine is not that expensive by comparison. So, you know, the, maybe the first thing you should try is chlorine. And whether or not you want to, you know, go to the 25 ppm or 40% of of CYA, that's a question you need to answer. But if you don't want to do that, then probably my next line of defense would be just a good old copper algicide. Yeah. But you need to first superchlorinate, 
and that will kind of weaken the algae a little bit, and it will also oxidize that that slime layer that gets um, over the top of the algae. It's a polysaccharide thing, and it gets kind of slimy in it, but it's like a dome, and the chlorine will break through that dome a little bit, and then when you when you brush, it'll make it easier to come off, but then when you add a copper algicide, the copper can get right through to the algae because it doesn't have to try to get through that clear dome of, of polysaccharide. So that would be my perhaps my next defense would then be to add a, a copper-based algicide and brush. And um, you need to brush perhaps a couple of times a day. But the point being that it really doesn't take much chlorine or algicide to kill algae, but it does have to get through that polysaccharide layer. And getting through that layer is difficult for algicides and chlorine. So when you brush, you, you brush away that clear slime layer that's over the top. And the longer the algae has been there, the greater that layer is because it gets to be self-protective. Um, we need to brush enough to get all that stuff away. Now, you can add some of these chlorine enhancers and, and bromide-based algicides. Um, if you use the one that's actually called Yellow Out, is an ammonia-based product, and it makes a specific type of chloramine that's pretty effective on algae. But you have to, to be very careful about how much chlorine's in the pool to begin with, how much of the product you add, and then you have to add the exact amount of chlorine they recommend. And then you're going to need a lot of chlorine when it's over to get rid of the ammonia to, to superchlorinate it away. So that may be a difficult thing. Some of these other um, yellow algicides have a base of sodium bromide. And we spoke about this before in a podcast, but um, you need to be careful about using sodium bromide-based algicides. And the reason is that they, once you put bromide into the water, you have then switched the pool to a bromine pool. And all the chlorine that you add after that is used for creating bromine from bromide that's in the water. And then bromine gets finished being bromine and goes back to being bromide. And so the bromide stays in the water and all your chlorine does is, is create more bromine. And um, it's difficult to unswitch the pool after you do that. So you need to be very careful when you use a sodium bromide-based product because you'll start using more chlorine. You, you won't really know why. And it can be a bad situation, especially if you add a couple of doses of those algicides. You can get to five or six parts per million of bromide in the water and you can never get a chlorine reading. All the chlor all your reading that you're reading on your test kit is bromide or bromine. So if that does happen, the only way to resolve that is drain. Yeah, it really is. There's not really anything that takes uh, bromine out of the water because bromine, technically, for a second, when you put bromide in the water, Br minus, the an oxidizer such as chlorine, ozone even a, a generator, is enough energy to make it into hyperbromous acid. Then when it, the hyperbromous acid gets acted upon by sunlight or it acts on bacteria or algae, it goes back to being bromide. And then when you put an oxidizer in, it goes to HOBR. And so it just keeps recycling. And unless it combines with something that takes it out of the game, um, there, it's still there. So even when it makes a bromamine, uh, bromamines auto decompose and it goes back to bromide. So um, it's really difficult. And the only thing that, that happens is from dilution and not even evaporation doesn't get rid of it. It's just backwash and, and whenever you lose some water, you replace it, you end up diluting uh, the bromide that's there. And it is possible, by the way, to have a pool with both chlorine and bromine in it because you can have, say, a, a part or two parts per million of bromide in there, and you can have uh, two parts per million of chlorine in there. So it looks like you have a reading of four parts per million of chlorine, and you've actually got two parts per million of bromine and two parts per million of, of chlorine in there. 
That's just wow. amazing. That's Guys, let's do this. Zach, I'm going to take a quick break here to take a word from our sponsors. When we come back, what I want to do is I know that one of the guys was talking to you with regards to an issue that he had on his pool. And what I want to do is try to talk to Bob about that to see if we can answer that question. But let's take a quick word from our sponsors. And when we come back, we'll we'll address that with Bob. The HyperPole from Ultimate Pool Tools is a pool care pole designed by pool professionals for pool professionals, featuring precision crafted carbon fiber and stainless steel construction. Go to ultimatepooltools.com or Instagram at Ultimate Pool Tools. Introducing Pool Invoice. Pool Invoice is pool billing software that was created specifically for the pool service and repair industry. It was developed for our industry and only our industry. Pool Invoice was built with reoccurring billing in mind. You can print, email, text invoices, or even send via WhatsApp. You can add reoccurring or yearly charges, accept credits, and set up auto pay. You can even see when customers have seen the invoice. It even has a customer portal where they can log in and see, print, and pay invoices. It has all of your customer's information on one page, so you don't need to search through hundreds of invoices looking for the one you need. Just go to the customer's profile, and it's all at your fingertips. It's currently in beta phase, so anyone can use it for free. Just go to poolinvoice.com and request an invitation at the bottom of the page. Pool Invoice was made for you. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're talking to Bob Lowry. We're talking about water chemistry. So, Zach, I know that one of the guys was reaching out to you with regards to an issue with the pool. And so what I'd like to do is try to get that answered and, and kind of give the scenario to Bob and see if we can try to help him get to the bottom of that. So maybe you can kind of talk to Bob a little bit about the pictures that were sent to you and the foaming, and we can try to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, so Mike with Spartan Pools in my area had reached out to me, and uh, he has a pool on his route that had some algae. So he went ahead and treated it with Coral Seas Green to Clean. And he's been sending me his chemistry, and it's, I mean, it's really spot on with what the targets need to be. Um, but what happened is that it started this foaming. And to me, you know, I've added some enzymes to like some CV600 to a pool and you kind of get that that foaming that goes around. And that's what it, it really looked like to me. But it was all over the pool and the, the, the pool water was cloudy. And so I know he's cleaned the filter. He's been letting it run for, you know, days. Um, and it's the foam started to kind of go away but the water was still cloudy. And then I got an update this morning that after the pool, he put it back on a schedule. And now after the pool shuts off and then comes back on, it kind of refoams up and starts the process all over. And I, I think I've got that pretty accurately stated, but I'm curious as to what could be causing the foaming. And then if you get into a situation like that, what are some things that we should do? Cause I had a pool that did the same thing and I just cleaned the filter two times a day, every day, and let it run. And then eventually it just kind of fixed itself. And I don't know if what I did was a solution or if something else I did and I didn't wasn't aware of solved the problem. Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the possibilities with regard to foaming, especially after you've added a, a specialty chemical, is there's a brand, there is a category of algicides that are called quats, Q-U-A-T-S. And that stands for quaternary ammonium. And many of these uh, algicide products are based on what are called quat algicides. And most of them start with the word benzene or benzalkonium. Um, and they are a category of algicides that, believe it or not, are about one molecule away from being soap. And as a result, um, overdosing and even just even a little bit of overdosing or using it too often um, creates a buildup in there and then they foam and it causes the whole pool to foam. And many times what we find happening is these uh, quad algicides are fairly inexpensive. So people buy a gallon of it and they think, well, you know, if this much is good, more is better. And so they dump in a gallon of algicide into their pool when they probably needed a quart or two quarts. And then they've got too much in there. And the next thing you know, their pool starts foaming. 
and then they try to use an anti-foam, and that works for, you know, about 20 minutes, and then the foam comes back. And so they end up with this problem. Every time the pool's off, it doesn't foam. When it's on, it does. And there's only two things that will remove that. And one, the first one is dilution. And so draining some of the water will remove it. But the other thing is that the ammonia part of this organic molecule, because it's uh, organic and ammonia, means that it's subject to being oxidized, just like any other source of ammonia in the water. So if you superchlorinate a couple of times, uh, you'll probably um, degrade and decompose the ammonia that's holding that molecule together, and it will break down. That's a possibility. The third possibility is just like when you're doing dishes in the in the sink in your kitchen, um, eventually the product you're using doesn't make any more more suds, and so you put some more on your sponge to wash dishes. So eventually the foaming will wear out, but who knows how soon that's going to be based on how much aldehyde you may have put in the water. Does that so with the cloudiness and the foaming? Do those sound like? You know, if someone were to get one of those algicides and pour a bunch in, is the cloudiness and the foaming going to be a result of that, or we got two separate issues to address here? Um, it's possible that there's another issue involved, and and that could be that another specialty product may have been used. And sometimes people think they have a problem and they put in a sequestering agent or a metal removing product and and then uh, find out that that didn't work and a week or two later then they put in an algicide and those two products are not compatible, especially once you start to add a higher level of chlorine trying to kill, uh, trying to kill the algae also. So those three things can kind of combine to make a, a pretty good mess in the pool, cloudy water and foaming. There are other reasons for foaming in the water, but most of those have to do with a, a low calcium, low alkalinity type situation, um, or somebody actually thinking it's a good thing to run water through a water softener before it goes into the pool. And another one is, believe it or not, there's at the water treating plant, some surfactants may be in the water, and the treatment plant actually is supposed to occasionally do a test on the tap water, and it's called a foamability test. And they actually measure how much foam the water makes under uh, repeatable conditions. But one of the things you can find out from time to time is if the water in your area um, has a lot of foam in it from the tap. And if you keep adding a lot of water, you may end up with a foam in the pool. And you can simply do that by taking a, you know, a glass or two of water and putting it in a blender and turning it on and spinning it. And if you get a lot of foam in it and then you put some bottled water in there and do it, you can see the difference between the foam the two of them make. And um, so it is possible that, that the city water that you're putting in there can have some, some surfactants and stuff in it that cause foam. In addition, bathers bring in with them um, a lot of stuff. And according to the household and personal products industry, men use an average of seven different personal products every day, and women use 13 uh, personal products every day on our bodies. You can think deodorant and soap and hairspray and, and baby powder and foot powder and, you know, sunblock and all those kinds of things like that. All that stuff comes off into the water uh, when you get in. And so um, sometimes foaming can be reduced by getting the, the users of the pool to simply rinse off before they get in. Not shower and soap and all of that, just rinse off. And all of that sunblock and sun lotion, all that stuff comes off of their body before they get in the pool. That's crazy. Yeah. So... I need to bring a blender out on my new pool checkouts to test there. <laughs> That'll really like elevate the professional look, I feel like. Well, 
Well, you know, it, it, it's only something that I occasionally used to do, <laughs> but because um, people would say, I don't understand. This is a brand new pool. I just filled it up and I got all this foam and I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe somebody used, had a cartridge filter and didn't uh, rinse it off well enough and put it back. And that's a possibility as well. You know, people put their cartridge filters, they clean them with soap, and then they don't rinse it off very well, and they stick it in the back in the in the service, and it, it foams the pool. You know, I didn't hear before, you just said it now, you said it was a Coral Seas green to clean, right? And I, the active ingredient in that is ammonium sulfate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So go figure, right? Right. I don't know, Zach, John, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to go out after the podcast and I am going to find an audio effect of like either a school bell ringing or a graduation. (laughs) And every time I have one of these moments, I'm just going to sit there, pause the podcast and just play that because I just feel like I went to school big time. (laughs) All right. (laughs) <laughs> no, and I, I can vouch for I can vouch for what you're saying and what Bob's saying about the ammonium or ammonia period in the pool. Out here in the desert, we have an issue with um, boatman bugs, and yeah. every about three or four times a year, they come from where they originally initiated from the Salton Sea, um, like a dead sea we have out here, and they came over and these little bugs that go into the pool, attach themselves to the wall. They're harmless, but they feed off microalgae. There's only a couple ways you can get rid of them. One, you can either put some kind of layer over the pool, so because they're air breathers, and when they try to break the surface, they can't breathe and they end up suffocating and dying. Or two, we add an an algicide, a certain type of algicide that has ammonia in it. And when you put it in the pool, it actually kills them. Um, And I had, it's like mass pandemonium here in the valley uh, a couple times a year where we get calls from like hundreds of people just saying, hey, I I have a pool and I have all these bugs and what do we do to get rid of them? And, you know, we went out to a call one day and a customer purchased a bottle of, it was a Hassa algicide and it had ammonia in it. If you read the directions, it only needs something like five ounces per 50,000 gallons of pool water. And they had a 10,000, about a 10,000, 12,000 gallon pool and they poured the whole thing in it. <laughs> and when we went there, it was literally, it looked like a bathtub. It had so much bubbles and it was cloudy. I think the same exact thing. I haven't seen the picture, Zach, or as far as the other pool. And we were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? So um, I did a little bit of research. I called the PASA and um, I spoke to them. We figured it out and said, one, was it going to be safe? Did I have to drain the pool? And it came out to just, we just had to overchlorinate it and shock it to hell so that it would oxidize it. And then over time through filtration and through sunlight and through tons of chlorine, um, it eventually subsided. But every time the pool turned on and the spillway shot over that water, it just turned into a bathtub. But eventually, after about a week, it went away. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, that's a good thing about sur- uh, surfactants is that they uh, they break down in, in sunlight and oxidation. So, you know, fortunately, it's not forever. All right, Bob, I have one question that was sent to us, and it was, can you talk a little bit about UV and ozone? And if I had to pick one, which one would you recommend? Okay, the the first answer that I would give you is that I need to know your purpose for wanting one of those. The reason for asking is, are you trying to get rid of chloramines? Um, is that a problem? Or... Are you worried about things like cryptosporidium or do you have a lot of uh, buildup of of organics in the water from soap and oil and deodorant and hairspray and those kinds of things? Are you just trying to lower the the amount of chlorine level, the uh, chlorine that you need in the pool? So I think you need to define the purpose first. It may not be an either or, it may be which product might be suited for what you want to do. But as an overall thing, I would say that probably ozone is a wiser choice than UV if you were going to choose between the two. Um, And part of the reason for that is that ozone is a better oxidizer and a better killer than chlorine. It just doesn't last very long in the water. But 
as a result, because it's a better oxidizer than chlorine, it oxidizes more things and it oxidizes those things quicker. And so it gets rid of chloramines, it gets rid of oil and soap and those kinds of things. And the things that we see from a practical standpoint and from a homeowner standpoint is that when we put ozone in the pool, um, we still have to use chlorine with it, but we are we see less um, ring around the tub, less scum and soap and build up on the on the tile. The tile stays really clean. We see less junk that gets in the skimmer that, that it's kind of sticky and moldy and stuff like that. Uh, those kinds of things go away. Depending on the amount of ozone you apply, you can get rid of anywhere between 50 to 90 percent of the chlorine usage. And what I'm saying is you still need the same residual of chlorine it will just take you a lot less chlorine to maintain it. So um, we don't want to get to the point where we are trying to run a pool, say, on a half a part per million of chlorine. And the reason for that is that if you have six people in a family jump into the pool and you've only got a half a part per million of chlorine in the pool, you're probably going to wipe out that half a part per million of chlorine. And now you got nothing. There's zero protection in the pool. And that's not a good thing because that means there's no protection for bather to bather transmission of disease. So we still need to keep a residual. And maybe with ozone, you could keep up a, a one, one and a half, or maybe two parts per million of chlorine in the pool along with the ozone. And then the question is how much ozone and the answer is how much can you afford? Probably most 15,000 gallons pools will probably need about five grams of ozone per hour. And um, that would be sufficient to, to really take care of the pool just great. And the longer you run the pump and the more ozone you put in, the less chlorine you'll use and the better the, the pool will be. As far as UV goes, the advantage to UV is the fact that it adds nothing to the water. So we're not adding another chemical to the water for somebody to be swimming in. It is uh, good at killing uh, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, Lamblia, many of the E. coli resistant uh, uh, bacteria. And so um, it's pretty good at doing that. Uh, it doesn't change anything in the water. Um, the disadvantage is that only those things that are going through that ultraviolet sterilizer are being killed. So if you have algae in the pool, if you have bacteria in the pool, if you've got a biofilm growing someplace, it's not going in front of that UV unit. It is pretty good at, at removing chloramines um, and killing some of the things that chlorine takes a long time to use. So I think the definition of what the purpose of getting uh, UV or ozone, I think you need to find that out first. But just in general, I would rather go with ozone than, than UV. But in some cases, even in a commercial case, you may need both of them. So that's my answer. I don't know if that is what you wanted to hear or if you need something more specific. Yeah, that's the question that they had submitted. So I, I can't give you a, a definition into what, you know, specifically they were looking for. But I think that's a, a great answer. Yeah. Okay. On the spot. Yep, right on the spot. And I know that now and we we had uh, Kevin last week on, on the podcast and he talked about uh, Hayward. They have a unit out that has UV and ozone uh, combined right. in that unit. So. Well, in, in UV and ozone, there, there's a third thing that you can make, that you can add to that, and it's called hydrogen peroxide. And when you put UV and ozone or UV and, and hydrogen peroxide or ozone and, per, and peroxide together, what it does is it makes what are called free radicals. And the overall process is called AOP, Advanced Oxidation Process. And that is using those three things in any manner together to create free radicals or uh, hydroxyl radicals. And you create those when ozone 
is ozone. Um, it is O3, three atoms of oxygen. And they can react with a something to be oxidized directly. But the cool thing is, the best thing is, when ozone degrades or decomposes, it decomposes into a free radical. It's called OH. And that free radical is a whole lot more powerful than ozone itself. Yet it only lives for about one millisecond. So it doesn't live very long, but it really is super powerful. So when ozone decomposes, it decomposes into a free radical, and a free radical can react with a bacteria or something to be oxidized. But if you add hydrogen peroxide um, to that system, it makes ozone decompose faster into free radicals. And so um, you en enhance ozone's ability to make free radicals. But under certain circumstances, the unit that makes ozone can also generate some hydrogen peroxide in the water. So you can have a system that generates ozone and hydrogen peroxide, add UV to it, and now you've got some super AOP. And enhancement of making uh, free radicals makes it a pretty cool thing. The problem is that it's even less of a lifespan than ozone. And we are, I mean, in the laboratory, these things last for a thousandth of one second. So they don't stay in the water very long at all. They are super powerful, but they don't stay around very long. And therefore, it's hard to measure them, and they don't build up in the water. And again, AOP, free radicals, and UV, hydrogen, peroxide, and ozone together don't make something that stays in the water very long and nothing that you can actually test. And therefore, again, we are talking bather to bather transmission of disease. And this stuff, when you make AOP, it, it's only making AOP, if it's making it in line in, this, in the plumbing system, I would doubt that any of those free radicals ever get to the pool because they only last a millisecond anyway, and in a millisecond, they don't travel very far. So AOP, wherever it's made, it's not going very far. So there's none of them in the pool. It's all happening in the, in the plumbing, and maybe even in the device. may not even be getting out of the device. But in any case, it's all happening there. So that means that there's no residual, there's no shield in the water to protect bathers. Yes, it kills stuff instantly, but if you got six or ten people that jump in the pool and they all give off a hundred million bacteria each, where's the protection? You need a residual in the water. You can't let these things uh, be a standalone uh, disinfectant and oxidizer. They don't. They can't work that way. Guys, I had a thought a little while ago about having that audio sound for the you know school or whatever, but now I'm thinking it probably be, it wouldn't be a good idea because I think I'd be pressing it too much and you guys would be pissed off at me kind of going, stop that damn <laughs> yeah. button thing out of here. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> so we have a podcast Look, that's an hour and half hour is that, that music just playing. <laughs> I appreciate the real talk. You know what I mean? And that's what this is all about. I mean, that's just real talk. It's facts, right? And you know, everybody's under the assumption or, you know, a lot of people are that you have this, you have this and you're going to be safe and OK. And you don't need to have chlorine in your pool and stuff. But the reality is you do. And but then that, that is the big reality. You know, we've yeah. got we've got three jobs to do in the pool. And that is we need to we need to disinfect, which is to kill bacteria and algae. We need to oxidize. And the biggest job is oxidation. It's not killing bacteria and algae. That's easy getting rid of the stuff that gets in the pool that's not bacteria and algae is a big thing. Getting rid of soap, oil, deodorant, hairspray, all those kinds of things. And then the last thing is we need to provide a residual that lasts and it's measurable. And that and that's a, a very important thing is to provide that shield, that protection from one bather to another. And all you have to think about is 
is when you're considering anything, whether it's a, an ionizer, an ozonator, whatever it is, what protects you getting in the pool and putting some of your bacteria in the water and then me getting your bacteria? What protects me from you and you from me? What protects us? Chlorine. Res but it, it's not only is it chlorine, but it's the residual that's in the water, right? Yep. And so the residual that's in the water is our protection that we're not going to infect each other. And if there's no residual in the water or the residual is only a short time, then then there's there's really no residual. People, some of these expensive ozonator, I've seen ozone systems that cost $40,000 for a pool. And, and it eliminates everything and it makes perfect water, makes better water than you can get in a bottled water. The answer is that you can measure that residual of ozone in the pool. But the question is, if you turn off that ozonator, how long is it before that residual disappears in the pool? And the answer is somewhere between 3 and 15 minutes, all the ozone is gone, all of it. And so then what's your protection? You have no residual in the water. People get in the pool, and then what? No protection. And then when it comes back on, how long is it going to take to recover? How long until it kills everything that's in there and, and you restore a residual? Absolutely. So, I mean, it just goes to the fact that, you know, these systems are to complement using chlorine in the pool. Not That's correct. Most of these things, the correct term is, is called a supplement. And, and they supplement a chlorine or a bromine reading. But you have to have something in the water that provides that residual and, and is a backup for when you have a big event. Because you can take it to the extreme and say, okay, I got a residential pool. What happens if 15 kids from the neighborhood jump in the pool? How long is it going to take for the, if you have an AOP system or an ozone system, how long do you think that that, whatever that oxidizer is or disinfectant that's in the water, how long do you think it's going to be around if you put 15 kids in the pool? Well, you know, they all take bathroom breaks. You know, they all get Well, of course, of course, you know. You know they it, all, it, all the little kids will get out of the bathroom. It, all, you all know, of it, it, bathroom. It, it is amazing to me, you know, my my wife owns a preschool here in Peru, and she's had uh, last year she had forty eight kids in the school. We took them all to McDonald's, right? And and everybody the the door to the to the bathroom was constantly being going in by kids and going out and so on. We took them to the pool, and an hour and a half nobody had to get up no, and go to the bathroom. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, it's amazing. They can hold they can hold their pee that long in the pool, but they can't when they're at the McDonald's. And, and you know that is so true. It's it's so true. You take a kid to a restaurant, and it's like I swear they just want to visit I'm the restaurant just to that visit. Is, yeah, the pool that, never analogy right there. that is a perfect analogy. <laughs> oh man, John, I can just picture you right now, just jumping up and down. <laughs> right, you just. This is the stuff that I know gets John kind of going. Oh, I love it. Well, uh, yeah. And I, for, for, I look forward to this every single time we talk to Bob because I just get to pick pick his brain just a little bit here and there. And then I go, okay, yeah, what I read here, okay, yes, I get that. Mm, that makes sense. Mm, that's something I need to start looking into or paying attention to. And, you know, uh, it, you know, it's all about learning, right? We talk about this, you know, every single time. And, you know, you can't, you got to keep that door open and that mind open and you got to start listening and you got to start taking in this information because you just can't get it from one source or you can't think that you know it already, you know, because it worked in the past or you think it worked in the past. You know, there's a lot of new evolved thinking, right? And a lot more, a lot more is going into the pool industry nowadays that I see than there was before, you know, and these new technologies and these things coming out and it's, and you need to prepare yourself with knowledge like this and getting all these questions asked and answered because these are real life situations, not just, you know, brochures and poster boards and stuff that manufacturers will throw out on a, this is what this does, this does, this does, this does, but no real life applications and, and how to really think about it. I think the way Bob kind of broke down um, AOP and the way he broke down UV and the way he broke down ozone is a hundred times better than what we've really heard, you know, because it's just, it's truthful. You know, and 
you know, there's a lot of misconception out there that people think that I have ozone or I'll have UV or I have AOP and I don't need chlorine in my pool. Uh, or the reality is that you do, you know, you just need, you need to have that protection just in case something happens. Yeah, you, you can eliminate most of the chlorine. Uh, I mean, you know, I have seen installations where, where it has been chlorine free, but we still put a backup in there of chlorine just in case, you know, and, and it's that just in case that, that is important. You know, because if you ever get the pool to where there's zero protection in the pool, what, you know, what prevents you from getting sick? You know, and they're just, and we call that bather to bather or swimmer to swimmer transmission. And that is one of the keys that we want people to understand that you have to prevent the bather to bather transmission of disease. We are tasked with that job as as pool service techs. That's our job. What um what amazes me about all of this too is that you know I'm learning because you know maintenance is newer for us. We had retail, we did repairs, and like you go through retail and every day your door is opening and you've got someone with sales slicks and they're you know giving you the sales pitch on why you need this, why you need that, how this is going to help, and it's like. The more and more I learn, and every day I'm still learning, it's like, let's get to the basics. Like, let's save some money. Let's make this way more simple than having all these complex products and these additives. And I I get it. Supplements serve their purpose, but it just amazes me. Like, you know, the whole, let's just take care of the algae with chlorine. Like, let's save on all those expensive algicides, you know? Um, Well, and that's the the point. You know, I have created a system of taking care of a pool that that only involves using liquid chlorine, acid, bicarb, soda ash, and air for aeration. And that's it. That's all you need in the pool. And I have people that have been following the method that I teach for two years. They've never bought an algicide, never used a phosphate remover, never had a nitrate free problem, never even shocked the pool in two years. They don't need algicides, enzymes. They don't need any of that stuff to take care of a pool. And it's easy to take care of. And and we've made it difficult over the years. And it's really easy to take care of a pool. And you can buy a book and learn how to do it. And and I made a book. And one of the things I tell people, listen, if you're thinking about doing something with your pool or you listen to some guy tell you about how to do something, ask him for his book. Right. You know, and and if all he's got is a piece of paper about his about his product, then he doesn't really have a program. He's got a product he's trying to sell you. And pool stores and distributors hate the things that I teach. And I teach you to use borate in your pools and liquid chlorine and, and acid and bicarb and air. And you don't need all the specialty chemicals. Well, the stores don't like to hear that. You know, they make a lot of money selling algicides and phosphate removers and enzymes and all those kinds of clarifiers and all those kinds of things. And if, if customers don't need that, then, you know, that's a lot of their money. You don't need all of those things to take care of a pool. And I can prove it. The book, the book that I have that's called Pool Chemistry for Service Pros, you can buy it as an ebook or a print, print copy for 15 bucks. And put it in your truck and follow what it's what it's doing what it says to do in the truck. I want to tell you one quick story. It takes about one minute. I had a guy. His name is Rich, and he has he stood up in a meeting and surprised me by saying this. He said, "My name is Rich So and So." He said, "I have 238 pools on service. I have six guys working for me, and we got a copy of Bob's book in March, and this is July, and from." From March to July, I've saved thirty thousand dollars, and I don't have any more problem pools. I used to have twenty percent of my pools were a problem. I have no more problem pools. My service techs know what they're doing. My customers are happier, and each service tech is now taking care of one more pool per day. Beautiful, uh, and, and I feel like two thousand twenty-one. 
is going to be we're going to have the same story as rich you know like I, I, that's what I, my feeling is for 2021 and the pool boys so i'm super pumped you know this time next year to take a look back and see what we were able to accomplish as far as cost savings and cutting out problem pools and just kind of compare this year to uh, next year to this year well and the, the other thing i can tell you is that book that i just mentioned we have now distributed more than 12,000 copies of that book. And I couldn't put 12,000 copies of that out there if it didn't work. I would have people calling, complaining to me, telling me, you know, what's going on? My phone would be ringing with people having problems. I've distributed 12,000 copies of that book and nobody's telling me it doesn't work. Well, that's Nobody. The thing. That's the beautiful thing about science and chemistry, right? It's you know facts are facts, right? It it took me it took me forty seven years to write that book. Guys, believe it or not, we've been talking for over an hour already. But the uh, amount of gee. information, Bob, that you bring to our podcast every time, I swear we just love it. We just love it, love it, love it, guys. Cool. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, Zach and John, today I want to get your final thoughts. The sound of you continually pitching pool care poles into the trash. The sound of you using an Ultimate Pool Tools carbon fiber pool care pole for years to come. Go to ultimatepooltools.com or Instagram at ultimatepooltools. Guys, welcome back. Today we're talking to Bob Lowry. He has definitely taken us to school today. A lot of great information on this podcast. Zach, let me start with you. Yeah, I mean, I love these episodes where, you know, we get asked these questions. And um, I was always the guy in all of the trainings that everyone hated because my hand was constantly going up, you know. And the more we start talking about these things, the more my mind starts going. Um, so I could really just go on forever, you know, doing doing these Q&As. And um, so and it just amazes me how much I still don't know. Every day I'm learning new things. Every time we talk to Bob, it's just like my mind is blown. Um, so just super pumped to do this. And then you know, I also want to add, if you guys or gals ever have questions, please send them to us and we can have Bob answer them for you. I love hearing your questions. It makes me think. It makes me have to problem solve. And then hopefully we can bring them here. Or you can call in. And we can get some answers um, to some of the problems you're having. So other than that, I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas. Thanks, Zach. John? Uh, just to parrot what, um, what Zach said, I mean, as much as you think you might know, there's always room to learn, right? And, you know, we live, breathe, eat, sleep, and you know what, pools all the time in chemistry, right? And I, I try to read and learn and, and listen to different perspectives. And as much as I might think I know, I'm constantly learning every single day and every time we have these podcasts especially having bob on i'm very excited just like you said edgar and it's just like i learned like three or four different things today and i can't wait to you know what i mean learn more for the next one that comes up you know and when we talk about these things it's like you know without we're not having there's no hidden agenda nothing we're just talking real talk and it's as far as you know what what works what doesn't work what we've seen work, you know, our past experiences and stuff. And I absolutely love, love having these uh, conversations. Bob, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to do this. I know you don't have to, but we really, really appreciate it. Uh, we know your time's very valuable. I, I wish you and your family and everybody else who's listening a Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or whatever it is that you celebrate. I just wish that you have a wonderful time and that you have a very prosperous new year. Guys, from me, I sit here and I just kind of think, oh, my God, how come I couldn't ask these questions 15 years ago when I started? Right. And just it, it all just kind of, John, like you were saying, Zach, it just kind of all comes together. And it's you ask the question and Bob answer it answers the question. And it just it's like that light bulb goes on and it just all clicks together. And it's like, there it is. It just makes sense. And I sit there and I look back at all the te people that explained a lot of the things to me but what they were doing is kind of what we do we kind of get little pieces here and there and then we kind of put it all together but then to be able to ask bob and him kind of go from the a and z and break it down and kind of i go back in time and go oh that's what they were kind of trying to say but it kind of quite didn't come out that way so just 
amazing, Bob. I love these podcasts. Uh, I sit on my chair and I kind of get antsy and I'm like a little kid where I, where I can't sit down and I, I just love these podcasts. So I want to wish everybody a great Christmas, a uh, great new year. Uh, Bob, Zach, John, I want to thank you for your friendship. This year has been an amazing year and I'm enjoying every aspect of it and every aspect of the friendship. And I'm getting a little emotional here because I think that means a lot more than anything else that we're, that we're trying to do and put together. So thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your time as usual. And guys, we will do our next podcast next Tuesday and uh, we will take it from there. So guys have a great Christmas and we'll talk soon. All right. So long, so long from Lima, Peru, as we say, uh, Feliz Navidad y Prospero Año Nuevo. There you go. Feliz Navidad. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Feliz Navidad, everybody. You can listen to us live every Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Central and 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can find us at Pool Nation or PoolNationPodcast.com or Instagram at Pool.Nation. 